Good morning, Earthlings. I thought I'd do Earthlings today instead of YouTubers or Pythonistas, some of these others, because my topic is pretty global today. Uh, I wanted to pick up where I left off on the previous video and then move on to sort of current affairs a little bit. I'm beginning to get more skills in the YouTube department, but as you can tell, I don't have uh, a large production crew. I'm not quite up to Alex Jones level. You might think of me as sort of another one of those weirdos on YouTube, and I understand because I have a niche market. Um, there's there's topics I talk about that you just don't find on every channel, and that's good. That's to my advantage. That's what I want. So the Dymaxian house is what's showing there. That's the outside shell. It was a, it, it was a, it's still in a, a museum, but it was out, somebody bought it. It was a prototype for Fuller's house and it was part of someone's estate for a while. And my friend Jay Baldwin and Robert Ornstein and some other people, uh, I knew Robert from LA from visiting the Fuller Institute and so on. They spent a summer at least maybe more cleaning this whole thing out. It was full of bat poop guano and stuff and they finally did get it um, in beautiful condition and access to the museum uh, the museum uh, took it into its collection now what it looks a lot like I wanted to point out and some of you may have noticed like but the fact that this looks so much like a yurt here's a yurt I've stayed at at the Quaker men's group it's not the most beautiful yurt, especially from the outside. It's nicer from the inside. But you can see that little cross hatching there in the back that goes all the way around. That's part of kind of the yurt design. And when you look at the Bucky Fuller thing that I was doing, let's go back. It looks a lot like a yurt, doesn't it? Can I zoom in on this? There we go. So that cross hatching there, and you see it in the picture to the right. That's a scale model of the Dymaxian house actually made by Fuller and included in a Chicago art museum. The art world has been really good about keeping the Bucky stuff alive. And uh, this is kind of on the twilight between, this is C60, and I would call it great art. And I think the inventor agrees to me, with me that there's art going here. What Fuller thought is if you make your technology as functional as possible to do what it's designed to do, it will inevitably be beautiful. And that nature is technology. See, Fuller used words differently. That's why there's a whole dictionary called Synergetics Dictionary. And he wanted to not think that just because humans design something, that's a whole different category than the inventiveness we see all around us in terms of like beehives. Aren't they high technology, coral reefs, basically everything at that point the universe becomes a synonym for technology and this becomes actually people who take drugs and stuff will tell you that but this is not an empirical claim it's not like you would read in the new york times some morning universe discovered to be technology it's what we call a tautology it's when you create a namespace and you make these equivalences, these global equivalences say that the whole world is a machine. And by world, by philosophy, they mean the universe. World is a parochialism for universe. So when they say the whole universe is technology, you know, that's what do we call that? You know, is that idealism, romanticism? I would say Fuller kind of, well, I've told you my, my thinking already. He's a, uh, he's a transcendentalist. He's an American transcendentalist in the tradition of, now you might not agree with me. And the thing is, I'm just wanting to bring up debates, not necessarily say you, you have to come down on one side or another, but to show continuity in topics. So you're talking about transcendentalists like Emerson and these people, it seems like the world was smaller then, right? And it was in terms of literate population. They all knew each other. Margaret Fuller, Fuller's great aunt, Emerson, Thoreau, and then across in England, connections to the Romantics, like Coleridge. And uh, who else? It's a long list. It's later we get overlap with Ezra Pound and so forth, who helped with uh, the career of James Joyce. 
And I mentioned about Fuller meeting Ezra Pound late in Ezra's life, and I mentioned that Ezra by then had been thrown in a mental hospital, but I should have added he had been released by then. After many years, though, in D.C., it was kind of a compromise. As I said, Ezra Pound was broadcasting on the wrong side during World War II. He, you know, you're going to see suffering and terror against people everywhere and in a war like that. So you can, you can feel for the people on both sides. And today, a popular movie would likely not demonize the other side and say World War I. That's long enough ago. Even World War II, there's more empathy with time for, you know, all sides, because all they did was suffer. And Ezra was like that. He was feeling for the suffering of the Italians. And I think he was kind of like Lord Byron, who ended up, um, well, A, spending a lot of time in Italy, and B, he's another romantic, by the way, and B, fighting for Greece um, in their army, or trying to organize a Greek army against Turkey, if you can remember, Ottoman Empire or something like this. Middle of the 1800s, poets do get involved in wars. Let's not have the stereotype that they don't. Um, and now Ernest Hemingway, he's not a romantic, not a transcendentalist, but he also got caught up in the uh, what we call the Spanish Civil War. But really, that was kind of a dry run for World War II. Drink some coffee and tie some more things together. So Fuller thought he had discovered, quote, the geometry of nature. What does that even mean? You can argue about it, you can debate about it, and you don't have to agree with Fuller. This book by uh, Hargitay, Isvan, and um, Magdolna, Symmetry. Um, these guys knew Applewhite some, and Applewhite, as I mentioned, was someone I collaborated with a bit. I'll talk about their trip out to visit me one day here in Oregon, and I visited them. I mostly visited with Ed in uh, Georgetown and so forth. But this connects us to orbitals and chemistry, and so, you know, synergetics doesn't take us deeply into the anatomy of an atom, and insofar as it does, perhaps it's incorrect. Fuller was hoping the neutrons and protons could be modeled by closest packed spheres in a more specific way than we probably need or want. And the, the gluon stuff had not been discovered. I just found something from Ed Applewhite here. Actually, just popped out in in this uh, book. I didn't know it was going to be here. Kind of interesting. Let's read a paragraph. This book, published on the West Coast and now saturating many of Washington's museum and architectural bookstores, is so attractive and germane to Bucky's work that I am sending copies to all of you. So that's kind of what Ed was like, generous. Anyway, what I would do if I were teaching in, say, college or university, is make a big connection between how transcendentalists like the Romantics were really into nature, and then take Fuller's claim to have discovered the geometry of nature as a continuity a point. So like here's the Dome Builder's Handbook, and here's art forms in nature, not by Bucky, but you know the fact that he had discovered um, a math that he thought could wrap itself around nature more easily because of the tetrahedron over the cube stuff, because of 60 degrees over 90 degrees, and you know how he ended up with uh, globes that looked more natural. That's why he's a continuation of the transcendentalist tradition. He's thinking of the mind of God. He's He is a deist. I think he's more a Unitarian than a Trinitarian. Uh, he doesn't, he, he's got no more secondhand God as a title, one of his better works in some ways, and that makes him also more Quaker, because the Quakers, part of that whole Protestant thing about no middlemen, he talks about hotline to God. So I'm just locating Fuller poetically and semantically in the space of continuity. Now, just to finish up here, 
in the space of literature, whatever. Let me go back to my photo stream, I think, is going to be the fastest way. And this picture from uh, RT, I think, is good. So here's your standard globe. Remember I was talking about Greenland as part of Denmark. It's really not obvious from the globes what country Greenland is supposed to be. Denmark, it says. D-E-N in parentheses. It's very not emphasized, is it? It's got other weird names on it, too. King Frederick the Eighth Land. I see. Uh-huh. Okay, so there's a globe, and then jump over to RT. This is very stylized. It's not... Now, RT is an interesting network. You see, for those of you who don't know the history, there's a, Air America was a television show, a, te a radio uh, network, and it had some alternative thinkers on it, like Tom Hartman, Randy Rhodes, Ed Schultz, um, and a lot of these thinkers once Air America fell apart for some reason, uh, ended up popping up on RT. So for me, RT was a continuation of Air America in a lot of ways. Um, if you look in Wikipedia, you can read about Air America. Anyway, just wanted to uh, end with that, I think. We'll talk more about the details of Martian math later, but the thing is, in Martian math, what you're trying to do is emphasize to earthlings that the Martians are using a different math and use that as a segue into discussing science fiction as well as literature. So I'm trying more than I would say most curriculum developers to make science fiction a home base for a lot of what the curriculum is about because that's how we access utopia, dystopia, and the steering function. You know, the fact that as a species, we are somehow trying to steer ourselves. We're not sure quite how we do it. It's like a Ouija board, right? It's like, who's pushing this thing if not me? That's how we all feel. No one feels like they're in control. That's okay. Because neither none of us are individually. But we do have some, uh, we do have the steering wheel in some way, and the call me trim tab uh, idea comes from there that the, we, we all have a steering function. All right, I'll, I'm going to do some post-production on this, add some more pictures, and see what we get. I'll talk to you later. Hang in there.